see that it's beginning to take shape. And with so many people, it wouldn't take too long, hopefully, to do that. And so as it's been coming together, whether it be a scenery of a, a mountain or the lake, and we see that beautiful picture coming together. And all of a sudden, we get to the end, and we notice that there are a few pieces missing. And so they're kind of some of the most essential pieces there. And we really cannot understand the fuel, 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 sorry, full beauty of that picture. Uh, now think about it this way. Think about if the pieces were alive and they were putting themselves together, then all of a sudden one separated from the other and then another pulled away. One didn't want to fit there and then the other just kind of got up and left. That's a kind of a, a crazy picture to think about, but think about that in the way, I wonder if that's how God sometimes sees the church. And the reason I ask that is, is so many times we do. There are essential pieces of each person and in a church. And when they don't work together, we don't get to see the beautiful picture here that, that God has designed the church to be. And so today I want us to think about this question. Why is it so easy for us to look after the interest of our own, but not the interest of other people? So today in this passage here in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, Paul has instructed the Corinthians here to be unified as one body and not cause division. And he lays out some pretty serious aspects about what he wants them to do here. And also, this applies to us today. Even though he wrote this letter to the Corinthians in Corinth, this, this same message applies for us. So first, let's, let's think about this today. And, and I've entitled my, my sermon here, The Dearest Place on Earth. Because if we understand what the church really is, we will see that as the dearest place on earth. So pray with me as we, we begin this. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives, God. I do pray that you would continue to bless um, this church as they continue their search for a pastor, a man to lead them, and, and the next uh, way to go. And God, we just ask that you would continue to give them wisdom as they make that, that search. And God, that you would even begin to move in the heart of their pastor now, um, whether he's at another church or he's lurking for a church, whatever that may look like, God, that you would bring them together and that, God, you would bless them exceedingly abundantly beyond all that they could ever ask for or imagine and that you would use them to uh, reach this area mightily for your name. And, God, we just ask that you would do that. I pray that you would bless this, this day, uh, that you would be glorified in all we say and do and think. And, Lord, we love you and we praise you for your salvation. And, Lord, we thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Like any time I've preached before with you guys, I definitely want to set up the context of this passage. So Paul is writing this sermon or this letter to the church at Corinth. And Corinth is a city uh, you may not know too much about, but think of it, I would say, as the modern-day Las Vegas. There's so much sin going on, rampant sexuality, all these different things, idols. It was a, it was a very prominent city in that day. There was, it was a trade center. There was just a lot of stuff going on in this city. So we really need to understand that context. And we've already, Paul has already talked about a lot of things in the first 11 chapters before we get to our, our passage here. Now, if we look at chapter 12, in the first, first, first 11 verses, he is talking about spiritual gifts. And we don't have time to go over that today, but it's a, a very important passage. In the preceding verses, 12 through 26, which is where we're going to focus today, it, it's very important that we understand that, that they were fighting over the different gifts, the more important gifts, as, as they may have called it, and understanding that. But, but Paul here is really wanting to show us three aspects about the body of Christ, and that's the imagery he uses here. So the first aspect that Paul notes here is that God has beautifully formed the body of Christ, and we see that here in verses 12 through 13. So follow along with me as I read. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So we see here in these first two verses that Paul uses this analogy of the body. And we all have a body, right? Otherwise we wouldn't be here. Just think about some of these amazing facts about the body, our, our physical body. Nerve impulses in our body travel to and from the brain of up to speeds of 250 miles per hour. So that's faster than a Formula One race car, uh, even faster than NASCAR. The human eye is so sensitive that if the earth was entirely flat, 
that you could see a candle flickering at night from up to 30 miles away. And that's pretty impressive. I know some of us may not be able to see two feet in front of us, but if the earth were flat, that is the way God designed our eyes. Now, along with the five traditional senses that we have, right, of sound, sight, touch, smell, and taste, human have, humans have 15 other senses. So these include balance, temperature, pain, and time, as well as internal senses for suffocation, thirst, and fullness. So if we really do think about the body, our human body, it is a pretty amazing thing. And, and one of my pastors there in Raleigh before I went to the church plant, he mentioned, he's like, one of the, the best ways to prove that God is, exists is when you're asleep. Because you can't keep your body going. You can't keep pumping your blood through your body, right? Only God can do that while you're asleep. You have no control of what goes on. He pumps the air in your body while you're asleep every night. And, and that's because he is God. He is a creator God. And when I thought about that, I was like, that's very true. I've never thought about it in that way. That God is God alone in the fact that he keeps your body going every night. And so I think it's just a powerful thing. So Paul uses this picture here because it's something we all relate to. He keeps going on and says uh, that it is. In verse 12, I really love how the Living Bible puts this verse. It says, Our bodies have many parts, but the parts make up only one body, and when they are all put together, so it is with the, the body of Christ. Excuse me. So our body has many parts. It has legs, it has arms, it has toes, it has fingers, belly button, on and on. There's so many different parts of the body we could talk about. And there are major organs, of course. We have our heart and we have our lungs, and those are essential to life. Now, there are some parts of our body that we could lose and be okay. We can lose teeth or we can ha give up a kidney, and, and they still will function. It will still go on. But there are things like our arms and our legs that are, that are very helpful, right? We, it's very easy to have those. But they're not exactly essential for us to live, right? We can, unfortunately, lose a limb or lose something, and we can continue to go on. But Paul is making the point here that they are helpful, but think about it. If our heart or our lungs stop working, unfortunately, life ceases. It ends. It, it can't go on. And those are essential to that. Now, those, the part, if you lose an arm, leg, or whatever that may look like, the body will have to adjust to that, but it can go on. And this is not the, the first time that Paul has used this illustration of the body. He uses it in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 5. He says, For as in one body we have many members, and, do, and the members do not all have the same function. So though we are many, are one body in Christ and individually members of it. He goes on in verse 13. Look at this list here that he uses in verse 13. He says, Jews and Greeks. He says, If we are baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we are all made to drink of one spirit. So he, he puts two things here. He says, You have the Jews and you have the Greeks. You have the slaves and the free men. And that's the exact opposite end of the spectrum. In that society, Jews and Greeks really didn't get along together. It'd be like a, a Duke and a UNC fan trying to get along together. It's not going to happen. Um, you know, uh, and so it, it's, that's how it works. It's this idea that there were separate people. But Paul makes this point. He reminded the Galatians of this same thing. And over in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So Paul was reminding them here that no matter what part of life they had come from, no matter whatever background they had, that they were one in the body of Christ, that they had that relationship with Jesus. And in verse 13 here, uh, or we talk about this, he says, it's not about the fact that we lose our rights when we become a part of the body of Christ. If, if nothing less, we gain more by becoming part of the body of Christ. And even James called himself a bondservant of God. We gain more when we are part of the body of Christ, when we're unified with the body of Christ. But Paul here is, in verse 13, he mentions there, we are baptized into one body. And he's not talking about water baptism here. He is, he is mentioning the one-time baptism of the Spirit at the moment of conversion. And so that's something very similar we have to understand. And to understand that we, we do need to understand that God has beautifully formed the body of Christ. And I'm not sure if you guys have had the opportunity to, to travel a lot. Um, thankfully, I've been blessed to do that and had the opportunity to travel overseas quite a bit um, and had the opportunity in numerous occasions to <laughs> worship with fellow believers there. And the first time this experience that I'm about to share with you ever happened was in Germany. It happened also in Mexico and Nepal when I was there. 
but we were at the church that we were working with in missionary in, in Germany and had the opportunity to worship with them. It was an English and German church, but we had just finished singing a song in English and had the opportunity to, to worship in that. And, and the next song they were going to do was in German. So all of our team not speaking German, we were just kind of like, all right, well, this is, we'll just have to listen. Um, so as they start the song and they started singing that first verse, we, we actually began to pick up on the tune and realize, hey, we know this song. And we began to sing in English while they were actually singing in German. And in that moment, it was just an understanding that our God is not a God of just English or a God of German. He is a God of all tribes, all tongues, and all nations. And to see that, oh, excuse me, to see that is so powerful because it is. We like to think that we have been blessed as a country, that God has, from our foundation of our country, that God has given us a country that was founded on those Christian principles. But, but God's not an American, and he's, I love my country with a passion. Um, I do, but he's not an American God. He's not a, a British God, an Indian God. He is a God of all tribes and all tongues. And so it just shows this picture here that, that Paul is mentioning in, in verse 13 that Jews and Greeks, they didn't get along. But he has, God has brought them together as a body of Christ for the purpose of doing his work. And so that first aspect here that Paul talks about is God has beautifully formed the body of Christ. Now look at the second aspect that Paul talks about here in verses 14 through 21. He says that God has intimately designed the body of Christ. And Paul, he continues this analogy through these whole, this whole verses here. And then he uses a series of questions and answers here to make his point. And it's kind of almost a, a crazy conversation to think of, of a body speaking to itself, but he really does hone in on what he wants to hear. So listen to these verses here as we read in verse 14. He says, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, Because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body, or if the ear says, Because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this any reason the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed many members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. If they were not all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, to the, the head, to the foot, I have no need of you. So we see here in these verses that Paul uses this illustration to understand the importance of the body. Just think about it, your body for a moment. You know, how unique it really is. No, not exactly your body and how unique it is, but God has uniquely created us. You, we all think about that. God, we have been created in God's image. From the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, we see that. That God created man in his image. Nothing else. No animal and how cute your dog may be. It, it wasn't created in God's image. It was the only thing was God, and he created men to be like him. Well, let's think about our body for a minute. You know, I'm sure there are parts of, body, or parts of our body that we wish looked differently, and over time things change, but think about if your feet were to go AWOL for some. You woke up one morning, and they just weren't there. They're, they're not there. They went AWOL. You know, and they did that. You, you finally found them in, in the, somewhere in your house, and like, what, what's the deal? Well, they, they didn't want to be part of your body because they were not your hands, or your ears, because they, they went AWOL because they were not your eyes. Well, God gave each of these a specific reason, right, for us, for them to be part of our body. You know, the eyes are to see. The hands are used for many things. Excuse me. They, they helped me write this sermon when I wrote that. You know, and your feet are used to walk. And if you can write with your feet, then that's a pretty cool skill too. But God has used each part of our body to serve in the capacity that it was meant to function in. And even though we have all these different parts of our body, it's still one body. You know, we don't talk about, oh, well, that's one body over there. No, it's one full body. You know, they all have a function in that body. And even when we think about that, the failure of one little valve in your heart, it, it causes issues. Um, my dad had a heart attack and actually um, on Christmas two years ago. And even it was kind of came back on New Year's Eve. And so just because of one little blocked artery, you can have a heart attack, and it's so it is so essential for that. You know, one lung can collapse, one liver can fail. And so Paul is using this analogy here to show the church at Corinth, hey, this is, this is how important the church is, how each member of the body of Christ is important to the overall body of Christ. And so 
the church here was fighting over essential gifts. They were thinking, oh, this, this gift is more important than that gift, and because I don't have it, that person is better than me. Well, no, that's, that's not what they were supposed to be doing. And they became disgruntled at their fellow members. Uh, one, oftentimes, you know, we, we may go into a church, many of you may have been in this church all your life, but if you've, you've come in from another church or you've ever visited another church, sometimes we look at ourselves in two different ways. We just think, hey, we're, we're doing pretty well, we're a strong believer, or we, we have a lot of experience in life, and, and we may think that we're a stronger believer, and, and that may be the case. And you may think you're better than others. You may not think of it that way. And, and not in a prideful way is what I'm talking about, but you may go into a church that way, or it may be the other way. You're a, a young believer. You, you're not so mature in your faith, and you, you see yourself as maybe a weaker part of the body. Well, that's not the right thinking to have here. And Paul wants us to understand that this harms the unity of the body. We may push off our weakness and say, oh, I'm not good enough to do what they've done. They've, they've been to college. They've done these things. And that's not, that's not what he's talking about here. We we need to understand that each person has a specific role to serve in the church. And one of the early church fathers here, he, he mentions on verses 14 and 15, listen to this. He says, the unity of the body consists in the fact that its many members supply the things which the other parts lack. This means that a weak brother cannot say that he is not part of the body simply because he is not strong. Now, think of that. Think of if we asked you to walk to you on the street, what is one of the most important parts of your body? You're probably going to say an internal organ, whether it be the heart or your lungs. We, those are essential. But think about your eyes. That's probably the outside of your body, one of the most important parts of our body. Just think, unfortunately, if you lost your eyesight. You know, you, you would see your sight, would, it would be hard, but you, you can adjust to those things. In any sense, would we lost that would be hard to, to go on. But just imagine that. If you're losing your eyes, it would make life more difficult. Not able to see a beautiful sunset at the ocean or not able to see your, your kids or your grandkids grow up. Or, or you would not have those things, and, and that would be tough, but life can, can go on. But think of your whole body was just one big eyeball, like just one. If you've ever seen Monsters, Inc., that movie, with a, he has one eyeball. Right? Just think if your whole body was an eyeball, and, and that would have no sense of smell, no sense of touch, or no sense of taste. And that's kind of essentially what Paul is saying here with the church at Corinth, that they were all fighting over the same thing. They wanted this gift compared to maybe what the gift that God had given them. And, and they all had the desire to do the same thing. And if we think about that, if everyone on the same team, if you've ever been to a basketball game, I've never played basketball, and I'm sure you, you think I have just because I'm tall, but never played basketball. But understanding that each person on the team, there's five positions, right? They each serve a purpose. Well, if they each try to do the same job, there's no way you can win because if each person thinks, oh, it's my job to shoot, well, that you can't win. And that's the same thing that the church at Corinth here was doing. They all wanted to do the same gifts. They all wanted the ones that were seen as the better gifts in the church. But that it's not going to work that way. And Paul continues this verse, this theme in verses 18 that shows that God's plan for the church has always been to be diverse, but at the same time unified. You can have diversity and still have unification. And Paul is just saying this. He says the body would not be a body if it were only one member. If you only had all the same people in the same church, where, there would be no variety. There would be nothing there that could promote that growth and unity that we, we would need to have. You know, as mentioned, um, someone in the church said that, that they're, they're, they were looking for these superior gifts and that they wanted this. And Paul is looking at this in verse 21. He says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or against Again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And so Jesus here is calling us to, to not see ourselves better than so-and-so in the church or worse than so-and-so in the church. Yeah, we all have our issues and we all have sin in our life that we need to get, get taken care of, but that doesn't mean you're better than the person next to you or the person who you may not like or whatever. Hey, no, we're all equal in that respect. And so the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No matter if you've committed the most heinous sin in the world or you may have committed what we call a, a small sin. Well, they're all equal in God's sight. And no matter who, you, no matter what you've done, you are not more important than someone in the church. You're, you're no less important than someone in the church. And so Paul reminds us here, those first two aspects, that God has beautifully formed the body of Christ and that he has also intimately designed the body of Christ. And the final aspect that Paul writes about here in, in these verses is that God desires unity in the body of Christ. 
And it's kind of this whole crux of this whole book is, is talking about the unification here of these believers in Corinth. And, of course, that, that translates to our society as well. And, and Paul has just been discussing this. He's been confronting issues throughout this book of, of different things, and he calls them to be done with that disunity. Stop fighting over petty things and, and get to what God has called you to do. So look at these last four verses here with me in verses 22. He says, On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable on those we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving them more abundant honor to that member which lacks, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And Paul is saying here that every member is essential to the body of Christ. You know, oftentimes, like I said, we, we treat others as if maybe they're not necessary or weaker. You know, we, we probably never say that out loud or even think that, right? But if you've ever looked at your actions and we ever sit down and, and think about that, I'm, I'm sure there's been a case that we've done that. And me, personally, in my own life, um, like I said, I'm, I'm part of a, a church plant um, that we I was sent out about three years ago in September from uh, a, a rather large church there in Raleigh. And um, so I've been there kind of since day one, so it's been a really cool opportunity. And, and one of um, the ways I was serving and still serving is uh, one of our first impressions teams where we just greet guests and help them feel welcome and, and you know, set up and tear down the sanctuary when we do that because we meet in a, in a gym and have that opportunity. And, and one of the guys who was kind of leading that at the time I never was rude to him, to him or anything, but sometimes I was just kind of like, when he would ask me to do something, like, okay, yeah, you know, maybe roll my eyes, not in front of him. But I really got convicted of that. And one of the sentences in uh, a book I was actually having to read for one of my classes really just convicted me of that. And he says in this book, he says, Every time you are tempted to shun another believer, remember that the Father, Son, and the Spirit were torn asunder so that you might be united. And when I read that, I was just super convicted because at the end of the day, it was something just not worth it. And, you know, we, we sometimes may hold that, that grudge, but it was so powerful for me. And I, I went to him later. I was like, hey, Trevor, this is, this is how you may have not known this, but this is kind of how I was reacting to you. And, you know, confess that to him and he forgave me. He didn't really think anything of it, but it was still something I needed to do and he needed to be uh, aware of. And, and so it was very... Uh, a good thing just to remind it that it, it is. We need to have that, that type of discussion. And Paul, continuing, he, he is correcting the Corinthians' thinking. And in verse 22, he, he does remind them and reminds us that the weaker parts of the body are necessary. We, we can't live without them. If you, if you just put a heart on the table, it, it's pretty weak, right? I mean, it is a strong organ. It's one of the strongest organs in our body. But you can't use it without anything else, right? It, you know, if we always talk about, you know, my brother-in-law is in the Marine Corps, and they, I know there's this, this thing that they are the best, and, and there is that thing. But the Marine Corps can't do it without the Army. The Army can't do it out with the Navy, and the Navy can't do it without the Air Force and not the Coast Guard. They all have to work together. They each have their individual role. This is what they're supposed to do, but they all are part of that. And so Paul wants us to remind us that that idea of the heart, it cannot survive on its own. If it's just a heart, well, then... Yeah, it's pretty strong with everything else, but it cannot survive on its own. So think about this. My undergrad um, degree excuse me, was in theater. Um, in result, I was going to teach high school theater before God called me into the ministry. And uh, so I, I have an undergrad in theater. And if you've ever been to a play at all, whether a Broadway musical or something local that you've seen a play, 100% of the time you're going to go to see the actors unless you know someone in the play and they're backstage, they ran the lights. But you're going to see the actors. You're not going to see the guy who's running the sound board or the light board or who painted all the set. You're going to see the actors. But though the play would not go on without those people behind the scenes. My, my degree was in that design side, so I was behind the scenes more so than in front. But you don't go to see them, but those people are essential. The play would not go on if you didn't have someone mashing the button that, on the light board that says go. Um, you know, yeah, it just takes a, a thumb, but those people are essential. It's the same idea in the body of, of Christ, that those people, we may, they may not always be in front. They may not always be doing things in front of everybody, but they may be the people who are, are spending hours and hours in prayer for your church and for your next pastor 
those people are essential to the body of Christ. And, and uh, just think through that. And St. Augustine um, points it, puts it so well. I love this illustration he talks about. He says, aren't the hairs on your head certainly of less value than any other members? What is cheaper, more despicable, lowly in your body than the hairs of your head? But yet, if the barber trimmed your hair unskillfully, you become angry because he does not cut your hair evenly. Yet you do not maintain the same concern for unity of the members in the church. And I'm sure everyone in here has had a bad haircut. You know, well, I'm sure. It, if you've gone through life without a bad haircut, man, that's awesome. But everyone has had a bad haircut, and we, we get frustrated at that. You know, they didn't do it on purpose. Maybe they did. Uh, maybe you did, you did something wrong. I don't know. But, no, that's the same concept for us is that we pay more attention to our hair. You know, oh, it's got to be in the right spot. It's got to be this. We've got to put enough hairspray on it or whatever. But uh, we don't put the same thing on the church of keeping the unity of the body of Christ. And the ultimate desire for any church, it, it is to, of course, glorify God in things. But you can't do that if you're not living in unity. And so one of my professors... He shared a great point um, on church conflict and that there's that idea in unity in the body of Christ. He says church conflict is robbing you for the sake of the gospel. And we must understand that we must do everything we can to promote unity in the body of Christ. And in this church, in my church, in the greater church of, of understanding that it is, we, we can't do it without the Presbyterians. We can't do it without the Methodists. Yeah, theologically we may disagree on a few things or big things, but we still need the Methodists, and we still need Presbyterians, and we still need all those things. I'm a Southern Baptist to the core, and, and unless God tells me to be otherwise, that's what I'm going to be. But I know that we cannot do it without them. Uh, think about this, too. Uh, you know, unfortunately, division does happen in churches all the time. And I'm sure unless you've never been, you've never read anything about any churches in the world, it just happens. And listen to what Matthew talks about. We, we must handle conflict biblically. That's what Jesus has called us to do. And in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 25, he says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly. Now, most of you, you've probably heard the verse that says, if you have something against your brother, go to them. And that's true. There is a verse that says that. But this verse says, if your brother has something against you. And so even if you haven't exactly... Maybe you haven't done something wrong to them, or they, they, you have, and you just don't realize that. He's saying go to your brother first and reconcile, even if it's something that they have against you. Make that right before them. And so when we live the gospel out in one another's lives, we do get to see this, that um, we can do that. We need to see that in light of the gospel that church unity is possible. Just a few things. How can we apply this in our own life? I think this is important for us to understand. First, we must understand that we are a part of the body of Christ. We need to know that. One, to know we've made that decision to follow Christ in our lives one day. And secondly, we must understand that God does use our spiritual gifts for a reason. We each have one, and it is our purpose to use those in accordingly. And third, we must promote unity and peace in the body of Christ. Well, how do we do that? How do we promote peace and unity in the body of Christ? We must resolve conflict biblically. We are called to be peacemakers, like Matthew says. Um, we are supposed to be peacemakers in the body of Christ. So here, to end my sermon here, I want to read one more section for you uh, of actually chapter 13. And we've all heard this, this passage numerous times, I'm sure. If you've ever been to a wedding, nine times out of ten, that's been read at the wedding. And unfortunately, that, this passage is not about marital love. It's, it's true, those things are true about marital love. But if you understand the whole context of chapters 1 through 12, you really understand why that Paul wrote this in chapter 13. That this is what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. That the unity in the body of Christ, this is what it's about in, in chapter 13. So think about all of those things that we've talked about today. As I read this, this chapter, I'm not going to read every single verse, but majority of the verses here. And then um, I'll close. But he says in verse 1 in chapter 13, he says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to say, to mountains move, but I do not have love, I am nothing. 
And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind and is not jealous, love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, it believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And skipping to verse 13, he says, But now if faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. And if we understand and we practice this kind of love in our churches that Paul talks about here in chapter 13, I really do begin to think that we will understand what the body of Christ is for and that small differences, it, it, won't, it won't matter. Yeah, we need to reconcile those and we need to talk through those, but, but Paul is just sharing this here. And I want to share with you, like I said, at the beginning of my sermon, I entitled this The, greatest, or the, um, the Dearest Place on Earth. And it comes from this quote by Charles Spurgeon, and then I'm finished. I know we're, we're over uh, time here, but listen to this as I close. He says, Charles Spurgeon wrote, Give yourself to the church. You are members of the church. You that are members of the church have not found it perfect, and I hope that you feel almost glad that you haven't. If I have never joined a church till I had found one that is perfect, I would never have found one at all. And the moment I did, if I had found one, I should have spoiled it, for if I, I would have not been a perfect church after I had joined it. Church, still imperfect as it is, is the dearest place on earth to us. All of us who have given first themselves to the Lord should speedily as possible give themselves to the Lord's people. How else is there to be a church on the earth? Nor need your own faults keep you back, for the church is not an institution for perfect people, but a sanctuary for sinners saved by grace, who they they are saved and are still sinners, need all the help they can get from the sympathy and guidance of the fellow believers and their church. The church is a nursery for God's weak children, where they are nourished and grow strong. It is the fold for Christ's sheep, the home for Christ's family. And so what does your response need to be? Uh, given this sermon is mainly for believers, and like I said, I, I never want to take for granted that there's someone here who doesn't have a relationship with Christ. But for those who of you are here are believers, uh, I think first remind yourself, hey, I, I, there is a time in my life that I made that decision to follow Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, that I am part of the body of Christ. But if there is something you do have against a brother or sister in Christ, go to them, repent of that, be reconciled, be a peacemaker. Don't wait for them to come to you. And it may take a while for them to forgive you. That's okay. You need to do your part and be reconciled with them. But it also may mean looking like giving yourself to this church, whether it's you've been a visitor for a long time or you are a member, but serving in some way that maybe you haven't. Like give yourself to the church. Yeah, there's some crazy things that go on in churches, but it is the dearest place on earth. And, and I love it more and more each time I, I understand what God has called us to do. And and finally, like I said, if you don't have that relationship with Jesus, give your life to Christ because it will be the best decision you've ever made in your life. And so um, become part of the body of Christ, whether as a, as a member or as someone who is serving and giving the time and the gifts that God has given you. And um, I, I think it's just a beautiful passage, and I hope that you will remember that that really is what church unity should look like in chapter 13, that that's what it is. It is patient. It is kind. And that's what God has called us to do as, as believers of Christ. Let me pray. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your love. I thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives, God. And I thank you that you have called us to be the body of Christ. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would just remind us of that. That in those moments where we get frustrated, uh, maybe it is something worth getting frustrated about. That you have called us to live in unity. That there is a time and a place that we need to to go and discuss that with our brother or sister and, and get that taken care of. But we go in love because love is patient and love is kind. And you have called us to be the body of Christ. And so I pray that, that Macon would um, see that, that this, this town would see that this church is about that, about being the body of Christ and being unified for the sake of the gospel. And so, God, I pray that you would continue to bless them. God, we thank you for your love. In your name I pray. Amen.